mothers, sisters, brothers, guests, and friends, the handful of us here in the sanctuary conducting service, and all of you who are joining us online. Welcome once more to the Lord's Day here at Richville United Church of Christ. Today we kick off the next season of the church year, having concluded Christmas time last week. Today we have the celebration of Baptism of the Lord Sunday. And uh, this last year in the lectionary cycle, we actually read at the beginning of Advent about Jesus' own baptism. So we're going to celebrate his baptism today, but we're going to be focusing on some other baptism scriptures later in service. Before we enter into worship proper, I do want to draw people's attention uh, to our weekly announcements. So if you go to richvilleucc.com, you can download under the bulletins and newsletters tab the weekly messenger, and you will see our ongoing calendar of events as well as uh, assorted announcements. There are a few of them that I want to lift up right now. First of all, as we've noted, uh, because of our safety precautions this year, we are not able to have our January congregational meeting that we ordinarily do. However, we have published the proposed budget, the tentative budget uh, for 2021. And if you swing past the church during regular office or programming hours, you can pick up a copy and review that. And if you have any questions or concerns, then you can address those to finance and stewardship or consistory. Budgets are available uh, if you want to swing by and pick those up. Uh, as we look at the week ahead, on Wednesday we will have our 6 p.m. Bible study. And right now, uh, since it falls under our small group safety protocols, we are meeting in person. But if you would like to join us via Zoom, please let me know and I will get you the login information. Bible study is both in person and online, 6 p.m. on Wednesday. Um, it looks like the weight loss group on Thursdays is returning to in-person. Uh, that's 10 a.m. here at the church. Right now, our Friday AA meeting is on hold, um, but they are looking at resuming as soon as we resume in-person worship, which I'll get to in just a moment. Next Sunday is our monthly youth service Sunday and noisy offering. Uh, so if you want to swing past the church throughout the course of the week and drop off, your second mile noisy offering that goes to either our capital improvement fund or mission and ministry outside of our own fall four walls through Habitat for Humanity. Sunday is also at 6 p.m. our senior high rise meeting, so please be in contact with Mr. Gary about that. Uh, I mentioned that we would be looking at in-person worship. Um, so as of right now, as we continue to monitor numbers for COVID cases in Stark County, our goal is to resume in-person worship the first Sunday of February, that'll be February 7th. Our goal right now, based on numbers, will be to resume in-person worship on February 7th. And the day before that, you can swing past the church and grab some Swiss steak uh, for our winter Swiss steak fundraiser. Um, and we're doing that by reservations this year. We have a limit of number of reservations we can take. So please do contact either the church office uh, or Debbie Sezelchek to get your reservations for February 6th, our next Swiss steak dinner. Loved ones, we serve a good and righteous king who came to us in the flesh and lived as one of us, bringing salvation with him. So we want to celebrate that now as we open the service formally through song with Come Thou, Almighty King.
time, and thank you, ladies. And now, friends, we draw our attention to our call to worship. Along with the angels, we give you all the credit, Lord, saying how glorious and strong you are. Even your name is holy and full of splendor. So forgive us, we pray, when we don't give you the worship you are due. May your voice continue to speak over the tumultuous waters of our lives and world. Help us to understand your thunderous words of power and majesty. Let even the strongest among us be broken by your commands, and may they also give us reason to jump and skip like newborn animals. For your voice is a purified fire and can shake up all of our complacency. Strip us of everything that leads us into sins of ego and pride. Teach us how important it is for the people who gather to worship you, to give you the glory. Grant us strength, Holy One, we humbly ask. You are our King forever, and we seek the peace you provide. Amen. That's God's word to and for the people of God, according to the book of the Acts of the Apostles. And it's important to note, as often as we turn to the book of Acts, uh, that's kind of the, the blueprint for the life and the work of the church once folks had received Jesus and the gift of the Holy Spirit. So may it help build us up today, along with our other two passages, as I seek God's restoring power for all of us, I'd ask that you would join me in a moment of prayer as we call down the Spirit's blessing on our conversation. Author and perfecter of our lives and our faith, you who binds your people together in the power of repentance and new life, we would ask this day as we approach the baptismal waters for all believers, including our Lord and Savior who established it for us, that those waters would be poured out like cleansing tears on behalf of the world you sent your Son to die for. God, pour out your Spirit to refresh and renew us. Pour out your Spirit that our hearts would be warmed 
our minds would be sharpened, our souls would be purified, and our hands would be strengthened for the work of the gospel. And now, Lord, I would ask that the words of my mouth and the thoughts and meditations of each of our hearts and minds might be acceptable in your sight. For this we pray through our rock and redeemer, the living word, Jesus the Christ. And may all God's people say, Amen. Amen. As I mentioned in the beginning of service, today is Baptism of the Lord Sunday, and ordinarily the passages recording John baptizing Jesus in the Jordan River would have been our focus. However, in 2020, one of the first weeks of Advent, we actually read that same passage. So today we look at how the baptism of Jesus is carried forward into the life of the early church, the first apostles and disciples. And we do so under the title of today's message, Wash Day. A two-word phrase, a familiar phrase probably for most of us. But depending on when and where and among what group of people you were born and raised, it may mean many different things. For some of us, Wash Day brings together recollections of filling the bathtub or the hand crank laundry machine and everybody in the household pulling everything together and maybe getting some chemical burns on your hands from the borax when you didn't dilute it enough. For other people who grew up on Walton Mountain in the middle of the city like I did, it was four generations of people at times pulling all of their laundry together and going to the tiny washing machine and load after load after load washing and then going with my grandmothers out to the line to hang, because it wasn't until a couple of years before her death that my mom would even entertain the thought of buying a drying machine. So for some of us, wash day brings together notions of laundry, maybe even cleaning the house. For others, the smell of burning hair after having spent hours washing, conditioning, picking out, and then getting the hot comb to press your hair to be ready for the week ahead. In either instance, wash day was about getting prepared to go out into the world for the week ahead. And wash day may not always have been entirely pleasant, but it is a shared experience across cultures in a variety of ways. Similarly, the notion of baptism means different things to different Christians, even as we hold it in common. When I had my born-again experience, I landed firmly in the once-saved, always-saved camp of understanding what baptism and a confession of faith meant. But over the years, in the midst of my time of study, of theological discernment, working with the scriptures, exploring history, as well as my own personal experiences, my definition and understanding of the sacrament of baptism has expanded. It has expanded to perhaps say something more to the effect of once saved, forever compelled to pursue greater Christ-likeness. Now mind you, I've been ecumenical my entire life, and I've enjoyed hanging out with Christians of assorted other denominations, even when I didn't see eye to eye with them on every jot or tittle of doctrine. In fact, when I first started out in professional ministry, I was offered a job doing laundry for a local Catholic convent. But I decided not to take it because I didn't want to pick up any more dirty habits. We are a work in progress people, sanctified by the redeeming blood of Jesus and the baptismal waters. And we are to be continually sanctifying our lives and the world through the power of the Holy Spirit, cleansed and cleansing, or in traditions such as this Christian tradition, we say reformed and always reforming. Even when we try to do the right thing, if we are not leaning into the power of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, as well as the baptism for the repentance and forgiveness of sins, even when we try to do the right thing, we can still make terrible mistakes. For instance, as I was leaving the laundromat the other day with all of my fresh, cleaned clothes folded up, I tripped 
and I spilled detergent all over everything that I was carrying. Sadly, there was nothing to be done. My hands were tied. <laughs> we feel as though our hands are tied, and in many respects they are, because we are fallen, sinful creatures. But through the power of the Holy Spirit, the model of Jesus, we can continue to learn and grow and be continually cleansed and cleansing, even though the forgiveness and the new life of our initial confession of faith sticks. As the Puritan preacher John Owen said, the person who understands the evil in his own heart is the only person who is useful, fruitful, and solid in his beliefs and obedience. Others only delude themselves and thus upset families, churches, nations, the world, and all other relationships. In their self-pride and judgment of others, they show great inconsistency. We want to be consistent in the vows we took at the moment of our baptism. We want to be consistent, if we have not made that confession of faith yet, in asking difficult questions so that we get the right answers. In fact, there's a, there's a joke about a Pentecostal church having a baptism service late in the afternoon down at the local river. And the inebriate of the town stumbled across the service, wandered down to the water, found himself standing next to the preacher. And the minister asked the drunken man, Mister, are you ready to find Jesus? And the man says, Sure, preach. So the minister immersed him in the water and pulled him right back up. And the preacher said, Have you found Jesus? The drunken man said, No, I, I didn't. Do you still want to find Jesus? Yes, yes I do. So the preacher dumped him, but this time held him under for quite a bit longer. Brought him back up. Have you found Jesus? Sorry, man, still haven't. Finally, in disgust, the minister took the man and held him down for at least 30 seconds. And this time when he brought him back up out of the water, he said in a harsh tone, My God, have you found Jesus yet? And the drunk man wiped his eyes and sputtered out water from his nose and mouth. And he said, No, are you sure this is where he fell in? <laughs> where are we looking for the real Jesus? As we think about the power and the promise of baptism, and that in the baptism of both Jesus and the Holy Spirit, we are new creatures who are forgiven, redeemed, and in the process of being restored, we have to make sure that our restoration journey is rooted in the right place to look for Jesus. And surprise, surprise, I'm going to suggest we have to turn first and foremost to the scriptures. As the neo-Orthodox Protestant scholar and pastor Karl Barth wrote, asking the child, why is this woman your mother, will produce the answer, because she is. Any question about the authority of the Bible in the church produces a similar result. Why is the Bible the authority in church? Because it is. The simple fact is that in the church of Jesus Christ, the Bible has a specific authority and significance which can only be affirmed. This quote is of great importance to us because Karl Barth was a scholar who understood how the Bible was compiled. Karl Barth was a neo-Orthodox theologian who believed that unless you apply all the skills and dedication of truly studying the Word of God, you were going to miss the Word of God, Jesus the Christ, who we're looking for in our authoritative book. And where Barth says the significance of Scripture can only be affirmed, I would suggest it must be affirmed. For we are looking in all the wrong places for who Jesus of Nazareth, the singular Lord and Savior of all creation, is. I ought to worship the Creator and not create a God who worships my own fallen, sinful hubris and pride. Hey, why is the capital city of the United States also the place where the most laundry gets done? Because they're washing tons. 
Actually, unfortunately, it's probably more likely that nobody's hands are clean. As our call to worship acknowledged for us out of Psalm 29, it is only when we humble ourselves and put our attention on the God who created and inspired and oversaw the collection of our scriptures. It's only when we look for Jesus in the right places that we can become truly cleansed and cleansing. And there was a joke that I've shared with any number of people, both in Bible study and from the pulpit over the years. A joke that came from the old Robin Williams movie, uh, Air America. And in it, uh, the character that, that he played, uh, or excuse me, Good Morning Vietnam, in it, the character that he played was a disc jockey for the military. And he was making fun of the differences in Christian denominations. And he says at one point, Hey, go ahead and go buy your Pope on a rope. Wash with it once, go straight to heaven. That's not how the scriptures work. We are not called to a complacency in our faith once we have claimed Jesus as Lord and Savior. The cleansing, sanctifying work must continue. For instance, in the United Church of Christ, we celebrate two sacraments, baptism and communion. And why do we consider those things sacraments? Well, the brief explanation is this. Jesus said to practice these things. Jesus did them himself. And Jesus said the Holy Spirit would be present in a special way. These activities not only are external signs of repentance and the forgiveness of sins given to us, but as Jesus told his followers right before his ascension in Matthew 28, part of being baptized into Christ means to go and make disciples, students, followers of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. To be a student, to be a disciple, means a continually learning and growing and getting stronger and more faithful to your rabbi, your teacher. Not trying to twist the words of the one who saved you to fit your own agenda. Keep being disciples. If wash day meant anything for you the first time you approached the waters. I'm not even discussing being rebaptized. If you want to reaffirm your baptismal vows, then by all means do that. Cleansed and always cleansing. Reformed and always reforming. But what I am saying is discipleship is not a one-time only choice. It is a way of life. Once again, the United Church of Christ, we address this in some very powerful and particular ways, even in our own liturgy of baptism. Let me share with you a few of the traditional components of that service. During the invitation and welcome, we recite words that are inspired by Scripture, saying, Dear friends, as we come to this font of living water, let us recall the meaning of baptism. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one, so it is with Christ. For it is by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews, Greeks, slaves, free, and all were made to drink of one Spirit. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. Furthermore, we acknowledge that Jesus said, unless we are born anew, we cannot see the reign or the kingdom of God. Unless we are born of water and spirit, we cannot enter God's new order. As Paul the Apostle said, all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into Christ's death. We were buried, therefore, with Christ by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead to the glory of God, we too might walk in newness of life. We have to die to ourselves and be born together in a unified vision of who Jesus is. Our unique ways of approaching wash day ought to be centered and rooted in the redeeming power of the only holy God. Furthermore, let's look at some of the questions that we ask of candidates of baptism in the UCC's traditional liturgy for that service. 
Do you desire to be baptized into the faith and family of Jesus the Christ? Will you renounce the powers of evil and injustice and receive the freedom and new life of Christ? Will you continue to profess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? Do you promise by the grace of God to be Christ's disciple, to follow in the way of our Savior, to resist oppression and evil, to show love and justice, to bear witness to the work and word of Jesus the Christ as best as you are able? Sounds to me like the moment of baptism is just the beginning of the story for faithful Christians. We cannot use our Lord and Savior as a slogan to endorse things that have nothing to do with his will or way in this world. It's a continual process of walking in the footsteps of the one who paved the way for us first. Remind me of the household I grew up in as I said at the beginning of this message, we had one day a week. Monday was wash day. Everybody in the house, all four grandparents, all three kids, my mom and dad, and whoever else we were putting up at the time, gathered all the laundry throughout the entire home. And we made Monday wash day. But we had to supplement it. With that many people in the house, all throughout the week, we would have to continue bringing smaller loads in and tidying up where everything had gone awry. If I had played in the mud or my grandfather's Parkinson's caused him to spill something and stain his shirt, we had to do an extra load. Monday was the main day, but there was a continual cleaning up. And even today, I think of the lessons of that because I have to admit, I have a hard time finishing my laundry. I always start out strong, but then halfway through the week, I end up throwing in the towel. In addition to making sure we're looking for Jesus in the right place, in addition to avoiding complacency in our Christian discipleship, we also need to make sure that we are not abusing the faith of the man from Nazareth. To illustrate that, I'll share with you the story of a young boy who came into the grocery store one day, and he was looking in the house cleaning department, humming and hawing. One of the clerks came by and said, what are you doing? He said, oh, I, I, I just got to get some, some soap. And she said, okay, well, well what are you going to get? And he grabbed some washing machine detergent. And the clerk said, oh, okay, so, so what do you need the detergent for? And the young boy said, I'm going to go home and wash my dog and make mom and dad proud. And the clerk said, oh, honey, I don't think you want to use the washing machine detergent, but the boy was undeterred. He had gone and been a big boy himself, went to the store on his own, paid for it with his own money, was going to go home and make his parents proud by washing his dog. A week later, the clerk saw the boy wandering around the candy aisle, and he was looking a little bit upset. He said, honey, how did... How did things go with the dog? And the boy said, he died. And the clerk just had this, I told you so, look on his face. And the boy picked up on it. He said, I don't think it was the detergent. It was probably the spin cycle. <laughs> don't misuse God's word and try to prop up things that have nothing to do with the word Jesus the Christ. Hey, what's the difference between Satan and people who use Christianity to support their own agendas? The devil can actually quote scripture. We have to get in the word for the word to get into us. While we are washed clean and forgiven, the moment we confess with our mouths and believe in our hearts, we are saved. We must continually be sanctified. We must continually reject evil and oppression in this world on behalf of the world to come. And that means that the people who are abusing the faith, the people who are corrupting or cherry-picking the Word of God out of the words of the Bible, we have to offer them the possibility of regeneration as well. Whenever I'm done with laundry day, 
and I'm cleaning out the dryer, and I find a single sock without a match. I put them in a special container, in an old ice cream tub. Do you know why I do that? It's called the lost souls bucket. What do the terms no mercy and dirty laundry have in common? No quarters. We ought not give a quarter or an inch on the principles of the Prince of Peace, but we always have to offer other people the same grace and chance to repent that was given to us first. So how do we determine that balance? How do we know if it's the voice of God speaking versus the voices of this world trying to co-opt the words of Christ? You'll see in a few moments that our prayer of dedication is based on the book of beginnings, the book of Genesis, chapter 1, and invokes the creation of the world accounts. There we get some hints as to when we know it's God's voice. What does God's voice do? Even in the dark, over the waters of the deep, which terrified ancient people, we know it was the voice of the Lord in the act of creation because the Lord spoke and produced order, not chaos. Light and life, not death and destruction. As we acknowledged earlier out of Psalm 29, how do we know that it's the voice of God thundering over the waters? Because it also compels us to give honor, glory, and ultimate allegiance only to our Creator, Redeemer, Sustainer God, made known and real in the flesh of Jesus of Nazareth. So, whatever wash day or baptism means to you, whatever Christian tradition you came out of, I want to say that wash day is every day. It's not so much because we have fear of damnation, but we have a growing longing to live more and more like Christ, empowered by the Spirit, building God's kingdom of justice and reconciliation. And we can take some pointers from those early disciples that Paul met in the passage Brittany read for us, where they had been baptized. They had confessed and repented of their sin. And when Paul said, but wait, there's more, they were humble enough and hungry enough to go ahead and not fight him about the definition of baptism. They said, great, give me more of Jesus. Pour out the Lord's Spirit upon me. And when they did receive that baptism of the Holy Spirit, what did they in turn do? They continued to walk in the spirits. They prophesied and spoke in tongues. In the New Testament, not the twisted corruptions of bad theology that make you say, the gift of speaking in tongues was explicitly designed to take the gospel to foreign countries and speak their language. The gift of prophecy is the gift of encouragement to call people back to God in repentance and confession. And if we kept reading just a few verses later in Acts 19, we'd see this. So after those 12 men were baptized in the Holy Spirit, as well as the saving waters of their initial baptism. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, persuasively leading people into the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe what they were being taught and publicly maligned the way. So Paul took his disciples with him and had discussions daily with the faithful followers in the hall of Tyrannus. We cannot malign the way of Jesus and expect the cleansed and cleansing waters of baptism to stick. But we can always believe that God is so good that we can be washed clean and put back together every time we listen to the voice of the still speaking God 
who brings order from chaos, brings life from death, brings reconciliation from division and hatred. Amen. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that can make me white as snow. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus and the continual outpouring and indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Let's honor that with our hymn of response. Come, Holy Spirit, dove divine. So once again, I would remind you that if you go to the church website, richvilleucc.com, you can download the messenger, and on the back of it, you will see our updated and ongoing prayer list for the week as of printing time on Friday. Um, as always, you can read that for yourself. Uh, if you're joining us online and you have a public prayer concern, you can type it into the comments field of this video. If you have something confidential, you can call, email, text, instant message me, and I will honor your wishes. Uh, you can also contact the church office or call to care representative with more public items, uh, as well as your instructions on how you want them shared. Beyond the items that you can read for yourself, uh, I do want to lift up a, uh, a item of thanks, as well as uh, some intercessions. So first of all, you'll notice that as we begin the new season of the church year, the sanctuary is essentially back to one of its most stripped down versions. Uh, and with that, I want to give God thanks not only for the volunteers who got the church ready for Advent and Christmas, but uh, the uh, volunteers who cleaned up and got us ready for this next phase of the church year. So thank you uh, for tearing down the decorations, getting everything put back together. I mentioned that we want to be standing in the gap for some other folks, um, and most notably, I'm going to lift up a son-in-law and dear friend and colleague of this congregation, Chris McBurney. Uh, those of you who know Chris know what an incredible man he is, and he shares his time, talents, and treasures in a variety of ways with many ministries all around the area. Um, and we also know that Chris has been having this on-again, off-again battle uh, with his shoulder. Uh, and I, I just found out this morning that uh, he has been uh, informed he's going to have to have three more surgeries on his shoulder. The first of which will be this Friday. 
So if you would talk to the Lord on Chris's behalf and ask the great physician to be working through the earthly doctors and medical staff, uh, we would greatly appreciate that. Friends, we know that when we come to this place of refuge, of sanctuary, of challenge, and of new life, we do so having lived in the world throughout the week. And we know the kind of week that we've all had around the globe and in this nation in particular. But we are watch people on the wall on behalf of the values of the kingdom of God. So we have, again, a responsibility and a privilege to approach God and intercede for the wounds of this world as well as give the Lord honor and glory for all of our gifts. Let's do that now in formal prayer. Holy One who birthed this beautiful, if troubled, world out of the waters of the deep, you who bore us again and granted us new life and the hope of eternal life through the waters of baptism, we ask that you would pour out upon us afresh the refining, renewing, rejuvenating, reconciling waters of our Christian baptism. May we renew our commitment to the things of the kingdom. May we hurt for those who were hurting, and may we pray for those who have done the hurting. May we recognize our own error and dive into your word so that your word would dwell within us more richly and fully. God, for all the ways that you have shown us that we are called to a new life and a different way of being in the world, in all the ways that you've proven to us that it's possible through the testimony of other believers and their efforts, we thank and praise you for the ways that you've sustained us in our rockiest of times. We honor your name. And we also realize we don't always have it all together ourselves. That we need to be refined and reformed by your potter's hand. So, in both grief and gratitude, we lift up before you now lives that have been lost or irreparably damaged. We lift up before you relationships that have been strained and are breaking amidst petty differences. We lift up before you the prayer of the ancient Jewish people, knowing that if we would humbly confess and repent, you would be quick to heal our lands. We know, oh God, that we are blessed to move forward in hope and the promise of real life for ourselves and for others. So whether we're confused or convicted right now, we cling to the other promise of Scripture that says, even when we don't know what or how to pray, your spirit intercedes on our behalf with sighs and groanings too deep for human words. Receive then now our personal, our private, our silent prayers and petitions. Thank you, O oh God, for the free gift of salvation. We trust that in confession and repentance, you save us for all eternity. We ask that you would continue to sanctify us as you give us the ability to be your cleansing agents in this world, even as we renew our commitment to the world to come through the will and way of Jesus the Christ, praying together the prayer he taught his own disciples, saying, Our Father, 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen and amen. speaking in tongues or prophecy or comfort or prayer, whatever God has placed within us, we bring it back before God so that it might bless others and bring the Lord's healing to this world. We do that with our time, our talents, and indeed our treasures. So until we can be back together in person, I do remind you that you can swing past the church with your offerings or pick up your new offering envelopes during regular programming and office hours. You can sign up for electronic deductions by contacting somebody from Finance and Stewardship. You can use our PayPal account, which is listed under RichvilleUCC at att.net. And as you all have so faithfully been doing, you can continue to call one another, check on each other, deliver one another groceries, take much needed, care out into the community keep our grounds beautiful you all exhibit the fact that baptism has made a difference in your life and for that let us all give thanks as we take up our tithes and our offerings <laughs> said that the Protestant reformer, Martin Luther, when he would get up every morning and wash up for the day ahead, he would go to his water basin and splash his face and say, remember your baptism. He knew that he was saved, but he also knew he had to continue to walk in what baptism means. And that means that not only are we cleansed in Jesus, but we get to be part of his cleansing for all the world that he so dearly loved. Now may the grace and peace of Jesus the Christ, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, and the eternal presence of God most high be with us all now and forevermore.
as we go in peace, loving and serving the Lord and one another. Amen. Amen.